Today I want to do something very interesting. I want to talk about what they never talk about in Bible schools and in seminaries. I have a degree in theology from a university, a very famous one here in America. I completed three bachelor's degrees from that university all in four years. I obtained a master's degree with honor. And I have in my possession now over five doctorate degrees bestowed upon me by universities. And after all of that, I've never heard any school, no seminary, no Bible school make that statement you see there. They just don't teach kingdom theology. Matter of fact, the term is not even mentioned. And as I sat in my classes in university, for four years studying theology, they made me read German writers. They made me read Catholic priests like St. Augustine. They made me study commentaries by Calvin, John Wesley. They made me study the deep thinkers that dealt with eschatology and rapture and, and all this stuff. But no one talked to me about the kingdom. And it's the only message Jesus preached. So I am challenging all schools. I don't care how famous they are. If you claim to be teaching and preparing people for the ministry, or for life, why don't you focus on what Jesus focused on, which is the kingdom? So I call it the original purpose of God. Let's talk about theology a little bit. Because most of you, just like me, you are layman, you are a business person, you are a retiree, you are an investor, you are a housewife, maybe a secretary, or maybe you are just a student. Whatever you are, big words like theology frighten you. So I thought it would be good to talk to you a little bit about some of these misconceptions about what things mean. First of all, make this statement, write it down, Christianity is a religion. That is a very sad statement, but it's true. If you ask anybody to name the first four great religions of the world, the answer would be Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. In other words, Christianity is, is thrown in with the rest. If you look at a form that you have to fill out and it asks you, what is your religion, and there's a blank, you'll probably put Christianity. Because that's what it is. You meet somebody from another religion and they say, what religion are you? What would you say? Christianity. You see, that's what it is. So if Christianity is a religion, it's important to define what a religion is. Because Hinduism is a religion too. Islam is a religion too. So if you are in their category, you're no different or better than them. This is why there are clashes between Muslims and Christians all over the world because they are competing for the same market. They are religions. This is why the Hindus are burning Christian churches in different parts of Pakistan, and, and Muslims are burning Christian churches in different parts of North Nigeria, because they are all religions. What is a religion? Write this down. A religion is the worship of a deity through a set of beliefs, expressed through a set of rituals. 
and customs and rights, producing a sectarian distinction and a unique group of people. That's a religion. And that's what you are if you are in a religion. If you are a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Hindu, that's what you are. All of you are the same. You are simply a group of people who worship a certain deity. The Muslims chose Allah. Allah is the God that the pagans worshipped in the land where Abraham was born. Abraham's father and family grew up in the land of Ur. Ur worshipped a god of the moon and the stars. Allah was their god. And God told Abraham, leave that place. This is why when you look at Islam, the symbol of Islam is a moon and a star. They claim they worship your God. Ask them if it's the same God. Tell them prove it. So all religions worship a deity. And from that worship they get certain beliefs. The Muslims believe in their religion. They got their beliefs all worked out. Hinduism believe in their religion. Christians believe in their religion. Buddhism believe in their religion. Yoga believe in their religion. Mormons believe in their religion. Everyone got belief systems. So having your belief system is no big deal. Everybody got them. Doesn't make you better than them. So if you are a religion, you are already in trouble. You are in competition, that's all. And then that belief system produces what? Rituals. The, the Muslim's ritual is a, three times a day, they got to find where the east is, and then they put their mat on the ground, and they pray in airports, anywhere. They pray as a ritual. They're supposed to face Mecca and pray. Christian ritual. We have to meet every Sunday morning. We have to have so few songs. We got to have some testimony. We got to have some offering. Got to have a little sermon for 10 minutes. And then you have a little altar call. And you go home. That's our ritual. The Hindus, they got to go to that temple, bow to six million gods, light an incense candle, burn it before the Lord, cross their legs, and they got to send their prayers up for a good harvest. Ritual. You're no different. Our theologies must be checked. Customs and rights. Rights are important. Rights, for example, R-I-T-E-S, all religions have rights. Sometimes you see the Hindus bathing in a certain river in India and they wash themselves in the, in the water because that's one of their rites of passage. They got to cleanse themselves. You got the Judas, Judaism. They got to go bathe in a certain type of pool to wash themselves before they go into the synagogue. It's, it's all rites. Our Christians got rites. Rites is you got to be baptized after you make a confession of faith. It's a rite of passage. Everyone have rites. Religion. The worst part is the last part. All religions create a sect. A sect that distinguishes them from others. And this is where the fight comes. The fight comes when the sense of being different from you clashes. You know, if a Muslim build a synagogue right next to your church. I wonder how you would feel. And by the way, it's coming to a town near you. It's a different sect. Therefore, they distinguish themselves by the way they dress. The Hindus dress differently, the Muslims dress differently, the Christians dress differently. I mean, what's your problem? They wear their time, you wear your tie. It ain't no different. Everybody got their 
little sectarian distinctions. It's all religion. Here's the good news. A kingdom is not a religion. I could go home now. I could quit. I'll finish my lecture. A kingdom is not a religion. Jesus Christ never introduced a religion to earth. First of all, he never joined one. He was never a Pharisee. He was never a Sadducee. He was never an Herodian. He never was a member of the Sanhedrin Council. He never submitted to Caiaphas, the high priest. And he only went to the synagogue so he could expose his message. The Bible actually said he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. In other words, the word synagogue is important here. The word synagogue is actually pronounced synagogue. Synagogue, shina means place, agog means meeting. A synagogue was not a temple. It was a meeting place. There was only one temple in Judaism. It was in Jerusalem. All the villages of those Jewish people had a synagogue. And the synagogue was kind of a replica idea of a community center. Because that's where the people went on the weekends. Shabbat. Sabbath. And they went there not just to worship, as people think. They went there because that was where the community met every weekend. If you wanted to know what was going on, you go to the synagogue. It was like a center of media, this, you know, explanation for news, what's going on. And, you know, that's why women and men went, because everybody wanted to know what's happening. You go to the synagogue. And of course, they would read the Torah in this community center, because the whole life of the community was built on the laws of the Torah. That was really their political center. Christ went there because everybody was there. He didn't go there because he believed in what they were doing. It was called marketing. That's why you advertise on TV. You go where the people are. The people in their houses with a remote. <laughs> if Christ was here today, he'd want to be on CNN. Why? He want to get his message out. The kingdom of God is here. You go where the people are. He never joined a religion. As a matter of fact, the, the truth be told, his number one opposition was not sinners. It was religious people. Because his message was completely opposed to what they taught. They're the ones who instigated his trial. They're the ones who called for his death. Religious people. Think. Think. How do we get like this? Write this down. A kingdom is a country. And this takes a very strong paradigm shift. To shift you from religion to country is difficult. To, to help you change your thinking from rituals to rights, R-I-G-H-T-S, is difficult. To change you from membership to citizenship is very difficult. Religion has members. Countries don't. Countries have citizens. And they're completely different creatures. Members have no power. Citizens have power. They got rights. 
So if you are in a religion, you are already in trouble. Because you have positioned yourself to be completely powerless. Rituals keep you busy. Customs keep you busy. That's why you go to the meetings all the time and you have programs all the time and you go into all these motions all the time and yet you're broke, sick, and depressed. Why? You get busyness but no power. The power comes from citizenship, not membership. What is a kingdom? It's a country governed by a king with all the components of a nation. That's why Jesus' message was difficult to understand because he was speaking to a community of people first who were ruled by religion. This is why his first word in his entire ministry, the first word he used is in Matthew 4 verse 17. Make a note of that. His first public statement is Matthew 4 17. And the first word of that statement is this word, repent. Repent means to change the way you think. He was attacking concepts first. He said, the way you're thinking is, it's wrong. You have to change your thinking. Your thinking is corrupted. You think as a religion. You think in terms of rituals and customs and traditions. He says, I come to give you something completely different. I come to give you the kingdom of heaven has arrived, he says. A country is here. It's tough to teach that. So, this is our challenge. There we go. What we ended up with is, is a century of conflict. Now, I want you to make a note of this. The theology of the 20th and the 21st century is not the principles of theology in the Bible. How's that for a shock? I dare anyone to challenge me. Anyone watching this CD, call me, argue with me. That's a daring statement. The, the theology of the 21st century and the 20th century, the one you lived in and the one we just came to, the church in those centuries have produced the principles of the theology that are not in the Bible. Do you know why? Because they are products of Catholicism. Yes, yes, yes. Don't forget that a, Pro a Protestant is a Catholic. <laughs> oh dear. I gotta explain that, right? Okay. The founder of Protestantism is a little Catholic priest whose name is Martin Luther. He was a German. He lived in a monastery. He died as a Catholic priest. He never stopped being a Catholic priest. What he did was he read the Bible himself one day. Now in those days, no one was allowed to read the Bible except the priests. The people were not allowed to touch the Bible. It was illegal to read the Bible in the Catholic Church. The Catholics believed that only the Pope and the Bishop had the will of God. And they still believe that today. So the people were not allowed to even touch the Bible. And Martin Luther one day, a little priest in that monastery, began to read the Bible himself, and he read Romans chapter 1. And he read verse 17. That's all he did. And it said, the just shall live by faith. He read that. And he realized that his church, the Catholic church, were actually justifying people by penitence. 
In other words, they had to come and give money and then they get their sins forgiven. And the Catholic priest would, you know, let them confess their sins before him and then they would be free. And they had to pay penance. Penance, they had to come, you know, and bring some offerings and, and then they, it was kind of like buying your salvation. And he said, this is amazing. This can't be right. So he went to his bishop and he says, I read this. His bishop says, what are you doing reading that? And he said, something's wrong with this. The bishop says, are you crazy? We can't talk about this. Why? The whole machinery of Europe is built on penitence, man. We're the most powerful church with more money than and even governments, brother. You can't challenge Rome. And that's how it began. He began to protest against. Protest. He was brought on trial and he refused to recant. So he, he remained a Catholic priest in exile. He loved the Catholic Church to his death. He was a Catholic. A few years later, the King of England, his name was Henry VIII. They were all Catholics. All of Europe was Catholic. Henry VIII was a Catholic. He still is, even in his grave. And Henry VIII had a problem with women. You all know the story about him? Henry VIII was married <laughs> eight times. He had eight wives. And his first wife that he had couldn't bear him a son, and he wanted an heir to his throne. Because kings need heirs to carry their legacy on. And his wife could not conceive. So he was in a dilemma. The Catholic Church did not allow divorce. It's against the Catholic laws. So he was a Catholic, and the king was actually the presider over the Catholic Church. In England, he was the leader of the church. So what do you do? You need an heir, your wife can't conceive, your, your kingdom is about to be lost because you can't pass it on, and your religion says you can't get a divorce. So Henry VIII decided, I'm going to change this myself. So he passed a new law. First, he appointed his own bishop, who he called his pope. He named him the Bishop of Canterbury. That's the name of the little city that he established for the head of his church. And the Bishop of Canterbury became the Pope of a faction of the Catholic Church controlled by Henry VIII. So even today, the Bishop of England is a Pope. That's why they can't get together with the Italian Pope, with the Pope in Rome, because they are in competition. That's, this is the problem. Henry created his own Pope and then told the Pope what to do. He told the Pope to rewrite the theology and give permission for divorce. Of course, if someone hires you, you got to do what they say. So the Bishop of Canterbury wrote a new theological then amendment and divorce became possible. Henry VIII got rid of his wife, married another woman. And he called his church the, the British church, the Anglo-Saxon church. That's Britain. <laughs> That's where we get the word Anglican from. Anglican, when they moved to the west, became known as Episcopalian. They are all Catholic still. So the creed of all Western religions, Baptist, Methodist, Anglican, Pentecostal, Church of God, Church of God in Christ, Assemblies of God, Charismatic, they are all Catholics. Check the creed of your church. Go read it. We believe in God the Father 
and God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We believe in the Holy Spirit. All that was written by the Catholic Church. You don't know your history. Here's my point. My point is, you think you are all right. A Protestant is simply a Catholic who believes you are saved by faith. An Anglican is simply a Catholic who believes you can get a divorce. Don't complicate it. And Jesus came and preached something completely different. The theology is wrong. Write down this number two. The kingdom concept is the foundation of all scripture. If you don't understand the kingdom concept, I guarantee you will misinterpret the Bible. Sometimes I feel so lonely out here by myself. Sometimes I ask God, like the Apostle Paul, why me? Why did you do this to me? I feel like a spectacle. Because I'm going to be attacked by everybody. How do I, I'm like a voice crying out all in the wilderness by myself saying, don't you get it? Go back and check it. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm afraid for you. Because you can live your whole life on a lie. Jesus told the Pharisees, if I had not come and spoken to you the truth, you would have an excuse. He said, but because I have told you the truth that my father gave me, you will die in your sins. He told that to the religious leaders of his day. And I'm saying the same thing today. You don't need to believe me, please. Just go back and read your Bible yourself. What you're hearing in this room today, great prophets and righteous men wanted to hear and didn't. The kingdom of God has come back. It has reemerged, And you are alive to see it. write this down the kingdom concept it is necessary for correct interpretation and application of scripture and what I mean by that is if you don't understand the kingdom concept you can never apply the principles in the text of the Bible correctly I sit many times and listen to preachers preach and because I don't have the kingdom concept their conclusions and their applications are erroneous and therefore they don't get the results God promised. You got to follow the right, not just instructions, but the right concepts to get the results promised by the manufacturer. You turn to any page in the Bible, any page, and show it to me, I'll find the kingdom there. Any page. <laughs> 43 years of struggle. My father was a Baptist preacher, still is. But he sits in my church on the front row now, taking notes. <laughs> I grew up in a pew. I was a member of the Brethren Church Assemblies, then I became a Baptist, and then I moved my mother to a Pentecostal church, then I went to the Methodist, and then I went to the Church Assemblies of God, I went to the Church of God, I've been through all that stuff, Anglican, my wife was a pure Anglican. We've been through all of this. So I'm not bashing religion, I've been in it. My father was a pastor. Some of y'all were pagans. You grew up on the block. Drinking liquor, man. I grew up in the choir. I'm an expert at religion. 
I used to play the piano for the choir. I was a Sunday school teacher. So I'm speaking with authority here. I know what it isn't. I ran into Jesus. And he tripped me down. And when I looked up, he says, get it right. And I started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for the first time in my life as a teenager. And I read them seven times in one sitting. I didn't move the whole day. And Christ jumped up the page. And I saw the kingdom. And I became a revolutionary in my country at age 17. All the churches attacked me at age 17. I was in the papers every day. The pastors called me a cult. You can't criticize me. It's too late. <laughs> when you get the kingdom revelation, it's impossible for you to be accepted by religious people. Just like Jesus, it's, it's, the message is so revolutionary. It shakes all the rites and customs and rituals of religion. But it's the only one that'll set you free. Write this down the best you can. The kingdom concepts are the main subject throughout scripture. The kingdom subject provides the foundation for understanding the motivation, purpose, plans, promises, and actions of God. If you want to understand what God is doing and why he's doing it all through history, you have to understand the kingdom concept. God is a king. He's not a prime minister. He's not a president. He's not a mayor. He said he's a king. The concept of king doesn't exist in America. So you begin at a, at a disadvantage right away. You never lived under a king. So even the, the rules of kingship is unknown. You, democracy is completely opposite to a king. So if your concepts are democratic, how are you going to read the Bible properly? So Christ says, repent. What repent means? Change the way you think. That takes a fearful transition. We are afraid to change our thinking because we are so comfortable with our thinking we don't want to disrupt our thinking. So we refuse the message. Hey, brother, I'm a Baptist. I'll die a Baptist. When I'm a Catholic. I'll die a Catholic. That's how people talk. Well, I know what you're saying is true, but brother, it's too late. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I got to get stable. Brother. See, and we got this whole block, this block, this, this hard, callous heart. Because it's so frightening to change your thinking. And yet the Bible teaches, as a man thinketh, in his heart, so is he. So you will never change into another man until your mind change. You can't understand God. Number five, without the kingdom concept, biblical understanding and theology is defective. And that's where we are right now. I'm teaching with great respect, please. I'm not attacking any one of you. But I have to challenge your thinking. That's my job. We have defective theology. And if I was to reveal some of, some of, the, of the defects to you, 
you would think I'm a heretic. For example, let, let, let me give you just one, and then you'll see that I'm a heretic. Watch this. <laughs> Calvary is not the gospel. But you call me a heretic by saying that. Because your whole church is built on Calvary. Jesus never told us to preach his death. He told us to preach. As you go, preach this message, he says. The kingdom of heaven has arrived. Very specific instructions, distinctive instructions. How can we miss this? Because we close our eyes. Our eyes are not closed. We close them. We're not blind, you know. We just close them. Hmm. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Should I show you that in scripture? That we close our eyes? I better show that to you because you're looking at me really funny. Turn your Bible to the 13th chapter, 13th chapter of Matthew. Matthew 13. Take a deep breath. Tell your neighbor something's coming. Tell your neighbor, hold on to your religion. You're about to lose it. <laughs> chapter 13 of Matthew is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. You should memorize it. In this chapter, Jesus Christ is talking about the kingdom. Matthew 13, get a pen. I want you to underline some things here. Verse 1, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. A great multitude of people came to him, and he sat in the boat and told them to listen. So he's about to teach them a big seminar. He's in the boat, sitting there, and they're on the shore. So there are probably hundreds of thousands of them, I don't know. But he's about to have this big class. It says in verse 3, Then he spoke many things to them in parables. How did he speak? Okay, very important words here now. He spoke to them in parables. And he began, one of the parables was this. Behold, a sower went out to sow. So he, he, he's explaining the kingdom, but he's using all kinds of symbols to explain the principles of it. He said, the kingdom of God is like a sower who goes out to sow. In those days, sowers, uh, you know, farmers, they would sow by putting the seeds in a big basket, put it around their neck, and they'd walk through the fields. And the field was not like the fields they way to have big combines to level the field. They had, the, they had fields with soils and rock. If, 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 you, if you go to Israel today, it is still the same way. Rocky country. So they had to throw the seeds out over the rock. And wherever there was a little soil between the rocks, if a seed fell there, then the plant would grow. If it fell on rock, it wouldn't grow at all. If it fell on thin soil with a little bit of rock, it would grow up and then die. So the seeds are being thrown out. And they land on different types of ground. He's teaching the kingdom. Watch this. And of course, all of you notice the story. He talks about, you know, this different type of soil. And then he says one fell on good ground, and of course it brings forth... Uh, let's just read that for some of you, because some of you all messed the scripture up and preach about money. Okay, Matthew 13, 88, read it. But those that fell on good ground yielded a crop, some 100 fold, 60 fold, 30 fold. Okay, we use that to collect offerings. He ain't talking about money. I'm going to prove it in a minute. But we use it as a gimmick. Because we don't know the kingdom. We manipulate people. Remember, we're Catholics, okay? We know how to make money. <laughs> Verse 9. He answered by saying, He who understands, understands. That's what that means. He who has a ears to hear, let him hear. Now, 
he spoke to all of them in parables. Remember that? Look at the next verse. Later on, his disciples came to him and says, why do you speak to the people in parables? They are confused, you see. He never spoke to the people plainly. He just tell them all these stories. And he answered them, because, now read verse 11, because it has been given to you only to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the kingdom. A country. But not given to them, he says. That's a whole new teaching altogether I could give you on that. But let me explain summary what he means. A parable is designed to conceal truth. Write it down. Parables are designed to hide truth until the listener is ready to receive it. Why? Because God doesn't waste seeds. Some of you are trying to convince your atheist brother about God. You're wasting your time. He ain't ready yet. So just tell him stories. That's what he means. These people, he says, they don't want to hear the truth yet. But I'll teach them the kingdom in stories. And then I'll leave the stories with them. And they go to their farms and their fishing companies and they take it with them. And then later, the story will make sense. And they'll say, aha. That's what parables do. Parables allow you to discover truth for yourself. Why? Because nothing is really yours until you discover it. Some people take my books and they read them. And they try to preach my books. You ain't got it yet. You read the book until you say, aha, now it's yours. That's why you study. You study to make things yours. He said, it's been given to you to know the mysteries, but not to them. Now, he has a second explanation. He says, only you I tell the plain truth to about the kingdom. But to the people outside, I say it in parables. Now, what makes the group different from the people? Here's the answer. God does not volunteer information. This is an important principle. God only gives you what you want to know. He'll only tell you what you want to know. He'll only show you what you desire to see. He hides everything else. And this is why most people can't see the kingdom. Why? They don't, they don't want to. He hides it. And that's the purpose for a parable, to hide it. Why? Because God only responds to hunger. Write it down. If you are hungry, you'll attract God. If you really want to know something, God will run to you. You know, some years ago, I was shocked as a teenager. I'm reading the Bible, and I got confused about two verses in the Bible. One verse says, I am the Lord God and I fill the earth. If you make your bed in hell, I'm there. In the highest heavens, I am there. I'm reading the verse and I'm thinking, God is everywhere. And then I read another verse, confuse me. It says, you will find me. Only if you seek me. And that with your whole heart. Then I'll let you find me. I'm like, wait a minute, you everywhere, but then I gotta find you? <laughs> yes, what he's saying is, I am everywhere, but I only reveal myself to those who want to see me. Your cousin, your uncle, your brother, your sister, they are not atheist. They just ain't interested yet. One lump in the breast and some colon cancer, they come look for you. 
Now, right now, they got some money and they're doing fine. One slap from the devil, they run to you. Please, where's your God? And then God, he revealed himself to them. He said, you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. Not casual interest. That's why he said to you guys, I'm going to tell you all plainly why. You left your business, your fishing company, your wives, your children, and you have come and attached yourself to me. You are personally running after me. You gave up everything for me. I'm going to tell you all everything. But them people, they ain't interested. They just want fish and bread. Free. They come for miracles. They don't come for the message. That's the problem. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your being in this conference... Please don't take this lightly. The kingdom of God is everywhere. But he says, seek first. It doesn't just show up in your life. You discover it. You got to look for it. You're coming here this morning, driving away from your house, your, your camper, your, your job. Already made God excited. And when you entered that Glory Road Avenue there, God was saying, I'm so proud of you. I'm going to teach you some stuff today because you abandoned some things to come learn the kingdom. Yes. Don't take it lightly that you're here. And this is why when you try to explain the kingdom to your family, they think you're a foreigner. They really think you're crazy because they, they can't see it. He said, I, I hide it from them, he says. You don't believe me? Read the next verse. He says, for whoever has to him will be given more. And he'd have abundance. But he who doesn't have, even what he has, will be taken away. He's saying, look, if you ain't got no interest, God will make sure you never get it. But if you got a little interest, a passion for it, I'll give you more, he says. A lady came to me in Naples yesterday before we left. She said, Dr. Monroe, when I first heard you speak on the kingdom, she said, matter of fact, you, this would be a good story for you, Pastor Phil. The Bible, uh, she, she told me, she says, they drove from Naples up here because they heard I was coming here. And they saw one of my YouTube messages on the kingdom. They never heard the kingdom. They're very wealthy people. And she said she drove up here with a friend and came to Christian retreat. That's where I was at the time. And she came in here and she said she sat in the back, right where you're sitting in the back there, and she sat and wept the whole session. Because her father, very wealthy, powerful multimillionaire, had said to her as a daughter, this God thing ain't real. And he almost convinced his kids and she said she knew there was something missing in my life. And she heard one session on YouTube that I taught on the kingdom. And she made a decision, I got to find that man. And she just so happened to receive a flyer that I was going to be here in Bradenton, Florida. And she made her way here, drove all those hours to get here. Sat in the back, she said, and wept. She said she had never heard such things about a kingdom. She said, it felt so sweet. It was so real. She said, that's what I'm looking for. And then she said, she was on crutches. She said, you know, she had broken a leg. She said, she hobbled outside after the session and bought everything on the table. Everything. Spent almost $800. She went home, she said, with boxes and bags of the books on the kingdom and books on relationships and books on marriage and books on leadership. And she said, every CD on the table in the kingdom, she said, I bought it. She, says, she said, and for the next six months, I soaked myself. 
She now owns a hotel right on the water. Beautiful hotel, like the Ritz. She owns it. She's not 40 years old yet. In the hotel, she has what she called the Kingdom Embassy. It's a beautiful hotel. Guests come, you know, beautiful hotel. But she has a place called an embassy. And every Sunday, they tune into our service live. And she got the guests coming in to get teaching. And then she teaches the kingdom herself. And now they got a beautiful little community in that hotel expanding. I went to speak there for the first time two days ago. I wonder if you get that kind of hunger for the kingdom or do you just run past and go buy lunch? To whom he who has, he says, more will be given. She had a desire. God give him more. Some folks ain't got no interest. God takes away the rest. He even takes away the interest. Verse 13. He says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. Hearing, they don't want to hear. Nor do they understand. Verse 14. And in, the, in, and in them, he says, Isaiah was actually talking about these people. Hearing, you will not hear, and you won't understand. Seeing, you will see, but not perceive. For the hearts, the word hearts there means minds. The minds of this people are what? Callous, grown dull, hard. I'm a Baptist, I stay a Baptist, I ain't never going to change. He says, see, that's their problem. Hard mind. I'm a charismatic, I'm a charismatic, I'm a faith teacher, I'm a faith man, faith, 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 faith. What about the kingdom? Brother, I'm a charismatic man of God. What about the kingdom? Your mind is just as bad as the Catholics. Callous, callous. Verse 15, their ears, and their, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have not closed, sorry, there it is, their eyes they have what? Closed. Underline that, that's what I want you to see. He didn't say they are blind. Isn't that amazing? He said what? Their eyes they have closed. When you close your eyes, you impose your own blindness. Imagine telling God, I appreciate that, but I don't want to see it. I know what he's saying is true. I can see it in the Bible, but brother, I got to stay with my religion. You're closing your eyes. No wonder why you will die in your sin, he says. Self-imposed ignorance is the height of stupidity and foolishness. You don't impose ignorance on yourself. They close their eyes, he says. Least they should what? See. In other words, we don't want to hear what you're saying, Dr. Monroe, because we're going to have to change what we believe. It's all there. I don't want to read your book. Why? You can make me leave my church. I didn't say that. That ain't my decision. My job is to expose you to the kingdom. They are afraid to see, he says, because if they do, then their eyes will be open, their ears will hear, watch this, and then they'll have to understand. <laughs> and their minds will understand it. And they'll what? Have to turn, read it, and then I'll have to heal them. Oh, Jesus, Lord. Christ says, I want to fix you. But I can't fix you until you want to be fixed. It's too late for me. You can't convince me to change this. I'm a kingdom man. It's too late. I'm, 
Listen, I'm having a good time. I flew here in my own jet and never prayed for it. It's parked right over there. And I don't preach prosperity. Because it's not the gospel. That stuff comes with the kingdom. Oh boy, I'm in trouble again. Look at that face, see? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me give you a word that kingdoms have. I was born in, the, born in the kingdom, okay, 1954, so I know what I'm talking about. I lived in the kingdom until 1973. Write this word down. Common wealth. That word is a kingdom word. I was born in a commonwealth in 1954. Look at, look at the word. It's actually two words, isn't it? What are the two words? Common. common. Well, in a kingdom, the wealth is common. That's why you don't talk about prosperity. Everybody's rich. Oh dear, too deep. That's why Jesus Christ said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means being right standing with the government's laws. And all the things you need shall be what? Add it. You don't go pray, bind, loose for them. That's why Christianity has so much stress, man. You got you to gotta believe God for a car. Lord, I'm believing you for a car. I'm believing in the name of Jesus. I need a car. I believe. That's hard work. Stress. That's why most Christians are sick. Stress. High blood pressure. Free radical cells in their bodies and the stress create tumors. A tumor is a good cell that has been under stress and it begins to multiply uncontrollably. It's called cancer. It comes from stress. Christ's first word to you. Why do you worry? What you will eat, and what you will drink, and what you will wear, and how you will live. He says, stop this. Only pagans do that, he says. Don't look now. There's one right behind you. <laughs> if you pray for food, you are a pagan, Jesus says. Take a deep breath. It's important, you know, because you'll choke if you don't. <laughs> we are not supposed to pray for clothes. We're in the kingdom. The king is responsible for his citizens. In a democracy, the citizens are responsible for themselves. Two different thinking altogether. So when you ask God for money and food, you insult him because you are telling him he's a negligent king. So what does he say? He says, take no thought of these things, he says. Don't even think about food and clothes and car. Don't insult me. He says what? Because your father knows what you need of, he says. Matthew 6, all this is Matthew 6. He said, all you're supposed to do is seek to get into the kingdom. Seek it, study it, pursue it, understand it, go after it, make your passion way. Get into it, understand it, he says, and everything will be added to you. Thank you, Jesus. Someday I'll come back and teach on faith. I'm really show you what faith was used for in the Bible. It was never used to get clothes and car and house. Faith is used to move mountains. That means things that are in the way. It's to curse trees that don't bear. Not to get things. You live by faith in the kingdom of God. It's your currency. 
believe what the king says and the king does what he promises that's faith but if you're going to use faith in the kingdom you point it at mountains not to get a meal the meal comes with citizenship hallelujah lift your right hand say Lord I repent I change my mind I will never worry again about my life what I will eat what I will drink what I will wear how I will live I surrender everything to you I am your servant I am your citizen I am under your government the kingdom of God is my jurisdiction I receive protection provision from my king from this day forward I have peace love and joy in the Holy Ghost this is the kingdom welcome home y'all oh let me just finish this before we go get 13 I want to show you something look at verse 16 now take a deep breath these last two verses are the important ones then he begins to talk about you in the verse that's the ones who are here this morning he says blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear because assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to hear what you are hearing and to see what you are seeing and they didn't hear it he made you more important than Moses Jeremiah Ezekiel, Daniel, Jose, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and Habakkuk. He said they wanted to hear what you hear today. What, what were they hearing about the kingdom? You don't believe me? Read the next verse. Therefore, let me explain the parable to you, he says. I like that statement. Christ didn't explain many of his parables. This one he did. So please, pastors, don't invent messages from this passage. Don't make up sermons that he didn't say. Don't use this to raise money. He's about to explain the kingdom, the parable. Now remember now, it's about what? Sower, sowing seeds, seeds falling in different places, etc. So he said, let me explain to you what the parable means. Verse 7, verse 18. When anyone hears the message about what? The kingdom. So what's the, what's the parable about? The message about the kingdom. And doesn't understand it fully, the devil himself comes to snatch it away. The literally begins to understand. The devil is so afraid of this message. The minute you hear it, he comes to snatch it away. Now you know, you, you assemblies of God, brother, don't get caught up in that. I mean, on your way out the door, he tells you that. Snatch it. Read the verse again, verse 18. 19, rather, go. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it fully, then the wicked one comes to snatch away what was sown in his heart, was heart, mind. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. And he goes on to talk about the fact that, that these th different groups are in, in every group. When you read the whole chapter, it says, the seed is the message of the kingdom. Not money. And the soil is the minds of the people. <laughs> some will get it, some will hate it. Some will refuse it, some will get excited and it'll die, and they'll go back to their old ways. Four different groups in every group I speak to. That's what he's talking about. And he says the devil is after all of them to snatch that message away from them. Because the devil knows if you ever capture the kingdom message, he can never control you again. Hallelujah. That's why I'm glad you're here, my brother. You know, you've been in church for a long time. You and your wife have been in church all these years, you know, 50, 60 years. And God says, you know, at the end, I want you to get the right one, he says. And he brought you here. 
He don't want you to retire with the wrong thing. Nicodemus was an old man. And he was a pastor of the synagogue all his life. Pastor. Came by night to Jesus. His question, how can I enter this kingdom? That was his question. Christ was 30 years old. Young fella. Just like me, young. And you come to me, Pastor Miles, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 70 and you, you young fella. Yes, 56, you know, you. Uh, but t tell me something. Teach me this, please. See, in order to keep your rituals. Kingdom challenges your history. You get two choices. Open your eye wide and go look for it. Or close your eyes and say, I wasn't at the conference. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I wasn't there. I didn't hear a thing. You got a choice. Either go and seek it or pretend it never existed. And you go back to your washing your hands. Tonight, we're going to talk about ideas. Because theology is about ideas. That's why you used the word ideology. <laughs> what are the source of your ideas you believe? Where'd you get them from? Henry VIII? The Pope? Calvin? Matthew Henry? Martin Luther? Where'd you get them from? St. Augustine? The source of your ideas is the source of your ideology. Your ideology becomes your theology. Your theology becomes your philosophy. Your philosophy becomes your life. And there you have it. So if your ideas are wrong, your whole life is wrong. Ready for this? And the word for ideas in Hebrew is the word word. In the Greek, it's the word logos. And that's what it says. In the beginning was the word, idea. And the word was with God. And the word was God. All things were made by Logos, God's idea. And God's idea became flesh. So Christ was God's original idea coming back to earth. When an idea is exposed, it's called a word. Prove it. You don't know what I'm thinking until I speak. So Christ is called the word. He's God's idea expressed. That's why he is called Logos. So whatever he says is God's idea. And his first statement, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Have a good lunch today. His ideas. 